The opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Cable 14, its sponsors or its shareholders, Kojiko Cable, Shaw Cable and Source Cable Limited. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Culture by the Minute. My name is Jeremy Freiberger, and I will be your host uh, for this episode. Uh, I come to you from Cobalt Connects, which is an art service organization here in Hamilton, and uh, we're happy to co-produce this show here on Cable 14, where we talk about all things culture in the city of Hamilton and beyond sometimes, and help you bring a, bring a bit of a lens to the cultural conversation in Hamilton. Uh, last episode, we talked about culture on the mountain. We talked to some folks on concession uh, about the new theater and the gallery space it's opening up and some of the stuff that the BIA is doing and we're sort of uh, continuing a bit of last week's mountain conversation and pulling it into this week's conversation about heritage properties more specifically about Akmar. Uh, our city is filled with history and historical spaces and historical properties and uh, they're important to us they're part of the fabric of this city and they they tell part of our human history about who's lived here in the past and what they did but they also become these physical spaces in our community and sort of the tangible uh, connection back to our history in Hamilton so historical properties are really important to this community we see protests and Facebook pages and and ad campaigns coming out of people like Graham Crawford and whatnot downtown trying to preserve some of that architectural heritage and um, history in our community and uh, I think that's really a, a, a topic that's coming up a lot in the conversations here in Hamilton. The city of Hamilton runs a number of historical or heritage properties like Dundurn Castle and Whitehern, the Museum of Steam and Technology, and they proudly keep those spaces functional and, and operational for the community and the public to step inside and sort of take a step back into our history and learn a bit about who we were. And then there are properties that we argue over and debate over uh, around whether we should keep them. I think of things like the Lister Block that were a long drawn out debate on whether we should be um, preserving that building and bringing it back to life uh, and then we look at buildings that have maybe been lost over time we look at things like the Royal Connaught which I think is sort of on its way out uh, not really being uh, upheld and we look at things like the Century Theatre and the Tivoli Theatre uh, having gone through better days for sure and we have to have this debate about when is it the right time to fight for a property when is it the right time to make a, a, a building more contemporary and bring it into the modern fabric of our society. Uh, so um, the next building that I really see or the community's really seeing come to the forefront on that conversation is Akmar Estates up on the mountain. And we want to talk about the future of Akmar, what's, what's happening and what has happened with that site over the last number of years, and where is its future. The city is taking a very different approach to Akmar than it has to other heritage properties in our community where they've actually said they've, you know, they've taken ownership of Akmar. I think it was in about 1999 they took ownership of Akmar and have been doing sort of band-aid maintenance and repair on that building. It's in rough shape but is salvageable by far. Um, uh, on that scale of whether we should keep it or tear it down but they've said that they actually don't have the funds which I think is somewhere between six and ten million dollars to fully restore that building and maintain that site and they actually don't have a game plan for what the end use would be on that building if they did do that restoration so council has voted to sort of reach out to the public reach out to our development community and our nonprofit community uh, and residents you know in general to say what should we do with Akmar what can we do with Akmar that's financially feasible but still gives it um, still maintains that heritage element in our community so that's what we're going to focus on talking about today about Akmar Estates and to join me for that conversation I have two um, exciting people I have uh, Pat Saunders who is the co-founder of the Friends of Akmar and the past president of the uh, Mountain Historical Society and Philip Toms of Philip Toms Architect who's obviously an architect here in Hamilton to uh, talk to us a bit about the building itself and sort of what can be done with buildings so uh, thank you both of you for joining me today. You're welcome. Uh, Pat, I'll start with you. Um, you obviously are our uh, resident historian on this issue. <laughs> um, I want you to talk to me a little bit about, tell me about the Mountain Historical Society mm -hmm. and, and also give us a little bit of a glimpse into the window of Akmar. What, why is that building important to our heritage here in Hamilton? Wow, that's a great question, Jeremy. Uh, well, the history of the Hamilton Mountain Heritage Society dates to 1996. It's a volunteer citizen group founded by the 
Reverend T. Melville Bailey, who devoted his whole life to preserving Hamilton's heritage. And so we're very proud to have that history as part of our history. And si since our incorporation, we have concentrated on recovering, recording, and preserving the history of the mountain. Um, people from the lower part of the city probably don't realize that the mountain has a culture of its own. In fact, it was uh, almost a self-contained uh, community until after the war years when the boundary started to expand south because there was nowhere else for the city to grow. But uh, we continue to meet on a regular basis, uh, trying to prevent, uh, present programs that are of interest in terms of our history. Our, our claim to fame, though, is the publication of our, our, uh, our coffee table book called The Mountain Memories. And I'm pleased to tell you we've gone into the fifth printing. Uh, I only have 150 more copies of the 500 that we ordered for, for the fifth time around. The sales are going well. and. Uh, uh, if you go to our website, you'll be able to uh, take advantage of a discount for a Christmas gift. Is that enough for the uh, Hamilton Mountain here? That's great for, Hamil <laughs> for the Hamilton Mountain so uh, Historical Society. Can you tell no, us a little bit Hamilton about Mountain specifically Heritage about... Society, oh, sorry, I'm getting the name wrong. There. <laughs> Can you give us a, a, a little bit more specific information about Ockmar and your connection to creating the Friends of Ockmar? Okay. Well, bec because of our, our goals and objectives, it's obvious that Ockmar becomes an integral part in fact, a few years ago, we were known to refer to it as the Dundurn of the Mountain. I have recently learned that uh, Isaac Buchanan would not have uh, appreciated having us refer to Ockmar as the Dundurn, so I probably won't say that anymore. <laughs> uh, what I will say, though, that Ockmar is one of the few remaining heritage buildings, uh, again, because the mountain is the newer part of, of the city of Hamilton. Uh, people probably don't realize how many beautiful homes we have already lost. Uh, the, mm -hmm. Do you want to give me your question again, Jeremy? Sure. Uh, talk to us a bit about uh, the Ockmar itself. Why, you know, the Buchanans uh, uh, built that site. When did they build it? And, and, and tell us a little bit about the, you know, the actual site itself. Okay. Well, the, uh, the record shows that the home was built in, uh, between 1852 and 1854 by the Honorable Isaac Buchanan for his family. They apparently originally intended it to be a summer home because even though the lower city probably wasn't as polluted then as it is now, the mountain was known for its pure air. Uh, Witness the uh, construction of the sanatorium. Uh, so when they originally built Ockmar, they intended it to be used for their summer home. But they were so enamored with the home that they, they did occupy the home as their, their residence. Uh, Honorable Isaac Buchanan and his wife Agnes and their nine children spent uh, at least 25 years in Ockmar. Wow. Uh, again, it's har hard to get the specific dates, but uh, uh, from mm. my uh, searching of the records, I would conclude that they uh, probably moved from Ockmar in the late 1870s because at the time of his death in 1883, they were living uh, in downtown Hamilton on uh, James Street South. Uh, is there something else you'd no, like me to tell that, you? That's great. That's great. So it's it's a site that's been uh, in our in our community for quite some time, uh -huh. and uh, from what I gather, it started with about 90 acres of land. It's now down to about 10 acres of land. Right. It's just on the mountain brow. For those of you that are trying to place in the community, it's uh, Kitty Corner to uh, Mohawk College, just up <laughs> on Fennel. Uh, and we had a chance to visit that site today. It was really fantastic. We'll get to a clip of that in a, in a minute or two. Um, but the state that the the building is in now. It's in it's sort of in disrepair a little bit, and uh, the city's been doing its best to sort of keep the building from um, degrading any further. And they're, they've committed to a, a good amount of work that they're working on the building uh, right this very moment. Uh, and Philip, we got a chance to to visit the site today. Uh, often when we talk about heritage buildings and whether it's time to save a building or let a building go, uh, those are the only two options that are presented. It's keep the building as it is and and sort of lock it in time. Um, like a Dundurn, or uh, tear it down and build something new on that site and sort of rejuvenate the neighborhood or turn the neighborhood into something new. From an architect's perspective, are those really the only two options we have? And is there room in Hamilton or in Canada to have the conversation about uh, reusing and, and, uh, and uh, bringing uh, you know, heritage buildings into a contemporary urban setting? From my perspective, Jeremy, I think this, it's, it's a no-brainer. You absolutely have to keep the heritage. To tear it down would be a huge loss. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing example of what was built well for the time. 
if we can do something where you're actually giving different groups of people the opportunity to visit the site, to my mind that would be ideal. If it's frozen in time as a museum, you're asking people to come to it for one reason only. If it had multiple uses across the site, there's lots of reasons for different groups of people to come to the site. So I think we have to maintain the, the building itself, but I don't think that means that we can't actually do anything with the site. There's a huge amount of space around the site, and I think it lends itself to multiple uses. The, build, the site is very disengaged at the moment from the roads and the street. It's actually not, it's not, in a, it's not actually a route to go from one place to another through the site. It's, it's, on two sides it's residential, on two sides it's a very busy street. I think we need to have something that draws people to the site. And if it's, a, if it's just a museum, then, we're, then it's basically sitting there like Whitehern and Dundon asking people to come there. And those, those sorts of spaces work I think we've shown that it works really, really well on, at events like Doors Open, where it's event-based as opposed to it's there all the time. I think we need to try and find some way to draw people to the site for not just one reason. So the, the, the city has, uh, like I said earlier, Philip, the city's decided to sort of take a different approach with this property, and they're going through what's called an REOI process, a request for expressions of interest process to draw in developers or community partners. And we've seen that Ockmar, we've seen Ockmar sort of go through that ringer a few times uh, uh, not too long ago. CISO was making a, a bid to sort of take over that facility and turn it into a new immigrant center in the community. There's already been talk of Mohawk College uh, wanting to get its hands on the property and turn it into something engaging for its students. Um, as an architect, you spent a little bit of time there with me today. Uh, were there limitations you saw on the site that would keep it from being any one thing in particular? And, and what do you think about the city's approach in taking that sort of open dialogue approach to uh, revisioning what Ockmar could be? I think if the city can garner some really great ideas and do it in a shorter time frame than it took for the list of block, that would be ideal. I don't th the site is big enough that it can accommodate more than one use. So when you say either a developer or a community partner, I don't see any reason why it couldn't be both. Mm. I don't think it has to be either one or the other. I think it could have a residential component. It could also have uh, Mohawk College. There could be a cultural institution, but the actual house itself, I think that could quite easily be maintained as a museum that's open to the public. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's also potential for a park space in there. It's, it's a large space. It's, it's quite an enormous site. Having actually walked the grounds, I've gone during doors open and whatnot, but I've actually not got to spend, you know, sort of a mountain of time just sort of wandering around and just contemplating the site. You really do get that sense from it that uh, whether that's what the Buchanans intended when they built it, um, but it's a space of possibilities. There's yeah. all sorts of opportunity on the site with the structures that are there and the open space and that whole conversation around open space um, in urban communities has become you know, a hot topic for sure and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll jump now to the clip with Dave Turner. So Dave Turner from the city, he is the supervisor of heritage facilities, joined <coughs> us and gave us a really great tour. We actually got to see all of the buildings on site except the carriage house. Um, and so he gave us a, a, a really thorough tour of the site and then gave us a bit of a, an idea of where the heritage designation on the site um, uh, constrains a developer or a, or a facility partner and where there are opportunities. So if we could uh, jump to that clip with Dave now, that'd be great. We're here uh, up at Ockmar, just on the top of the mountain brow, uh, with Dave Turner, who's the supervisor of historical facilities with the city of Hamilton. We've gotten a beyond the doors open tour of everything, the basement, all the interesting rooms throughout Ockmar. And as you know, today's episode focused on Ockmar. And Dave's going to give us a little bit of insight into what this property is. It's been designated with uh, through the Ontario Heritage Act and what portions of the site are designated. So Dave, if you could talk to me a little bit about this site and what on the property what within the buildings is part of that designation. Okay, so Jeremy, the whole entire grounds, there's 9.5 acres of property here, and that is uh, protected by the Ont an Ontario Heritage Trust. So the you can't do anything with the property unless you have that uh, approval from Ont Ontario Heritage Trust to, to do anything. So they're protecting the green space, and they, they're not going to allow anything to be built on that. I mean, there's always, you can always... Uh, get around that I mean but they're that's what they're doing they're protecting the space the the property is protected the manor house the original manor house is protected the coach house which is the old stable the dovecote is protected and the stone wall that surrounds the property is all protected 
So there's a, a whole mess of different space that's that's protected here. And it's, it's kind of a unique site in that the green space is actually protected as well. So um, uh, I think that brings an interesting element to the redevelopment of this site and sort of how it's reimagined. You're in charge of a bunch of these facilities. I imagine St. Mark's Funder falls under your wing as well. What about this building do you love? What what makes it an exciting space for you to be part of? Well, you've been you've just been inside. I th I find anybody that walks inside, they just automatically fall in love with the building. The the woodwork, the plaster work, the detail, it's just gorgeous and and you know you fall in love with the building right away. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we will continue to explore the issue of Akmar with the rest of this episode and uh, thanks for joining us, Dave. Thank Appreciate you. it. So there's a little glimpse inside Akmar, and it's usually open during doors open. It's uh, but you don't get to see everything we just saw there. Some shots of the basement and the uh, the uh, nunnery and the sort of church space that's uh, that was added on sometime probably in the 60s. Uh, Pat, tell us a bit more about Friends of Akmar. Why did the group start? What is it hoping to do? And and how can people get involved in the Friends of Akmar? Well, th just let me clarify though. The uh, Buchanan family did return to Akmar after. Uh, uh, Isaac died in 1883. Uh, for a brief period it was empty, then it was sold to uh, Colonel Trigg, and I think it was about uh, 1909, well, one of the uh, uh, sons of Ochmer, uh, sons of uh, Buchanan, purchased the home again, and the family returned to live there until 1926, hmm. when it was sold to the second family, the A.V. Young family, who actually lived there until 1947, when Ochmer was sold to an order of uh, social service nuns who uh, lived there until 1997 uh, or 1999 when it, the property was purchased by the city of Hamilton. So I just wanted to clarify that. Get the timeline right. It's important Very with good. these places. Now you yeah. want, want me to tell you about the Friends of Akmar? Yes. Uh, well, d depends on who you talk to will determine when the Friends of Akmar were founded. My, my own involvement dates to about 2009 when it was obvious that the uh, building was at risk in terms of uh, damage and repairs that it needed and so uh, we decided uh, w when I say we I was actively involved with others in the community that uh, we, we needed to address this through the culture department of the city of Hamilton at that time and, and to this day Anna Bradford is the manager of the culture section and so we uh, plan to have uh, a tea uh, I facetiously build it as uh, come for tea with Anna and I was sorry the king couldn't come but uh, that was based on Anna and the King of Siam, in case people don't know. But anyway, Anna did come to address a, a small group of heritage activists, most of whom were members of the Hamilton Mountain Heritage Society. And through that meeting, we determined that uh, there was sufficient interest and support that, uh, that, that we couldn't continue to watch this building deteriorate. We had to do something about it. And again, through our heritage connections, we became aware that other groups uh, would go through a process of incorporation, which then gave them some credibility in terms of uh, addressing, especially a municipal council. Uh, and so we followed that route, um, mo modeling us on the uh, Friends, Friends of the Freeman Station in uh, Burlington, mm -hmm. which had recently incorporated. And we went through uh, the process of connecting with the uh, Ontario Historical Society who uh, allowed us to incorporate and again it was a process that we went through and I'm uh, pleased to tell you that we are now an incorporated group uh, so uh, people are welcome to join we have a very reasonable membership uh, we actually have a website so if you visit our website friendsofakmar.com you will see you can actually take your membership out on uh, uh, the website by applying for membership and uh, uh, the position I hold on, on the board of the Friends of Akmar is the membership coordinator. So at this point in time, because we, we do not have any way of arranging the finances through our, our website, you would just write a check to the Friends of Akmar and send it to my attention. Uh, the address is on the website. Excellent. And what does, wh what's, what does the Friends of Akmar hope to achieve? If, if everything went according to plan for the Friends of Akmar, what, what would the end goal be? Well, I should tell, for starters, uh, there is a meeting at City Hall uh, at 5.30 today in which we've invited our members. We now have ni 91 paid members. Our goal is 1,000, and so uh, it behooves us then to come up with creative ideas to increase that membership to 1,000 members so that uh, officials will sit up and pay attention to us. Uh, our goal at bottom line is to preserve Ockmark. Uh, 
personally, I, I'm supportive of the goals that uh, have been put forward by the city of Hamilton. Bottom line is that it stay in public ownership and that the public have access to the building. At uh, 5.30, we have invited our uh, members to share with us what their ideas are. I'm sure that every person who's willing to speak will have their own idea of what they think Ockmar should be used for. And the expectation would be that from all those wonderful ideas, uh, we will put our collective heads together and uh, come up with the best plan for Ockmar and hope that the city of Hamilton accepts it. There you go. That sounds like a worthy goal. Uh, <laughs> Philip, you and I have been involved a number of times in the past uh, with sort of design ideas or charrettes or things of that sort, proposals uh, with the city of Hamilton. How do you, are, are there processes you would change or, or ways of gathering ideas and moving projects forward that you'd like to see the city of Hamilton embrace with a project like this where it sounds like the city and the community are kind of on stride right now with agreeing that we need to come up with a, a, an interesting partnership to make this facility come together or, or any advice from you to them on how to make that happen in a productive and timely manner? Um, it's something that architects have talked about an awful lot about how the city procures services and it's sort of it's related to this and I agree that we need to have um, community participation and um, charrettes but I also think it would um, be a wonderful idea if the city put out a call and actually did an architectural competition that draws on the ideas of the community participation you know for mm. what the uses might be and how the site might be developed and then as a group of professionals allow architects to actually put together schemes that can then be presented back to the public. Um, community participation and charrettes take, take ideas to a certain point, but allowing um, architects to sort of, you know, do what they do and sort of find the, um, find creative uses and ideas that might not, you come up with ideas that might not um, sort of come forward in a community venue, I think could be useful to the city. Um, I mean, there's, I mean, walking around there this morning, I was struck by, you know, just how sort of disconnected it is from the street and disconnected mm. from the landscape. I mean, the original house, um, the connection between the gardens and the house was a very important part of it. Mm. And you know, there were terraces around the house, there were balconies, none of which exist anymore. It's, it's, it's a very flat building now and it doesn't have that connection to the gardens. Um, it's very, very disconnected from the street and I was, Sorry, just getting back to what struck me, the, the great difference between the, the site, um, the ground floor of Akma and the sidewalks as they sort of wrap around the site. I mean, the building, whatever it's developed into, would need to be sort of brought up to contemporary standards. I mean, mm -hmm. at the time when it was built, it was, it was, it was forward thinking in that it had a washroom and a furnace, and that was a, <laughs> that was a, big, de that was a big deal at the time, but that's not enough now. Right. There's a sort of a there's a there's a sort of a I imagine there's a skin of a skin of occupiable space which is at the level of the basement which could come out towards the sidewalk and Fennel and West Fifth which would allow the building or a new part of the building which would not obscure the view of the classic view of Alkmaar from the southwest but occupiable space that could actually come out to engage the sidewalk. Um, so that I, it's, I mean, I think what I'm gathering from you is, is that there's a, a whole host of ideas that can come forward on everything from what are we doing with the physical space and the building itself, but also the grounds around it, who participates in a project, and, uh, and when, you know, to focus on what this show focuses on, 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 on creative industries and cultural industries, when do you engage uh, creative professionals from our community to help guide that conversation? I know that uh, in preparation for this, I emailed Councillor Chad Collins, and he mentioned that he thinks, and I think Anna Bradford is on side, that there needs to be some sort of uh, an event where um, potential partners and creative minds like yourself can be brought to the table to say let's get a little lecture on what the heritage issues are here and what can and can't be touched let's talk about what potential uses might be um, so that informed concepts can move forward uh, on what the future of the building could be as opposed to simple speculation or sort of armchair planners can come up with I think it's important that we engage people like yourself as architects and designers to really be able to frame that conversation on what's possible with a site like this can I jump in a second on the on the what's what's allowed to be done and what's possible mm -hmm. I think the realities if this if Alkma was in a different city where the economic realities are let's pick let's say Oakville or Toronto or some larger center where the where the economics are entirely different. If Alkmaar was there, what's, 
what's possible for Arkham, I think is quite different. How, if this site were to be developed, the amount of money that it would take to restore Akma to its former glory would be the would be absorbed quite easily if the project were in Oakville, where it's not absorbed nearly as easily mm -hmm. being in Hamilton. And I don't think the um, Ontario Heritage Act necessarily recognizes the different f financial realities of different municipalities. So it's a bit of a call to the upper levels of government to step in and play a sort of a balancing role to ensure that communities the size of Hamilton can actually preserve their architecture while embracing you know, new contemporary ideas that are maybe a little less feasible here because of market conditions compared to other cities. So um, just a taste, everyone, of what is, <laughs> what is the conversation around Akmar and the, the conversation that needs to go into what we really can do with a site like Akmar. Um, I always hate to cut conversation off, but we're nearing the end of our show. Um, so I'm going to quickly jump to a handful of events that we always like to promote at the end of our show. So we've got three events coming up for you. The first annual year-end show uh, on December 6th at the Nathaniel Hewson Gallery, which is on 24 John Street, an article in The Spectator about them today. Check them out uh, for their first annual year-end show. The Hamilton Arts Council's second annual art auction and fundraiser is on November 29th at 7 p.m., being held at the Upper James Toyota um, with the uh, home of Ilya Panassi on Upper James. Uh, so another mountain event. And Lit Live, uh, featuring Stan Rogel and Joe Arno Lawson, I think it's supposed to be Joanna Lawson, uh, December 2nd, uh, 7 p.m. at Homegrown Hamilton, right downtown. Uh, so a literary event for you. Um, great to have both Pat and Philip uh, in the studio with me today to talk about Akmar Heritage Sites. I can't say it enough, people are really, imp I think, really important to the, the physical landscape of our community. And you see organizations like Artscape and the Project for Public Space uh, really bringing the concept of how important public space is in the development of urban cities uh, like Hamilton to the forefront. I think you really need to keep your eye on what's going on with Akmar. Engage in the process once the city launches and tells us how we can do that get involved with groups like the Friends of Akmar or the um, historical societies throughout our community to be really aware of what's going on in your community uh, with sites like Akmar. So look forward to seeing where that goes with the City of Hamilton. That is our show for this week, Culture by the Minute here on Cable 14. Uh, once again, I'm Jeremy Freiberger from Cobalt Connects. Uh, have a creative couple of weeks and we'll be back in two to talk to you more about local culture.